focus on is trying to explain why austerity has become the dominant policy supported by broad sections of the capitalist class and by their political representatives all across the capitalist world. After a very brief period, immediately after the beginnings of the economic crisis in 2007, when there was a very brief return to government intervention to save failing corporations, capitalists and their political representatives across the world have launched attacks on social welfare and public sector workers under the banners of that we're all familiar with, balancing budgets, eliminating government debt, etc. In Europe, the traditional parties of the working class on the left, the labor and social democratic parties, long ago abandoned the struggles for reforms and embraced what our comrades in Europe have called social liberalism. In the past three years, these parties, almost across the board, have joined with the parties of the center and right to attack social benefits and attack public sector workers. In the US, the two ruling parties, the Democrats and Republicans, have also gone on an all-out offensive against the remains of what in the US is an exceedingly meager welfare state. They've joined in hands and bastion, the assaults on what's the last bastion of organized labor in the United States, the public sector. Their differences at this point remain basically tactical. The Republicans want to eliminate unions of any sort, eliminate the last vestiges of the New Deal compromise where there's collective bargaining and dues collection, etc. Whereas the Democrats are willing to continue that given that the union officials turn over a good portion of our union money to Democratic candidates and are, but, and are willing to sit down and talk with union leaders as long as union leaders agree to massive givebacks, cuts in public services, etc. Okay? Now, despite this consensus among capitalists, and if you look at the organizations that speak very directly for capitalists in this country and elsewhere, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Business Roundtable, etc., and a consensus among all pro-capitalist politicians, from the establishment left to the establishment right, on austerity, there are many on the left in this country and globally who've argued that austerity is an irrational and counterproductive economic policy. From the liberal, old-school social democratic left, Paul Krugman, who writes an op-ed column in the New York Times, has led the charge against austerity as a strategy that will only deepen <laughs> unemployment and deepen economic stagnation. In a recent op-ed piece that he wrote in February in the Times called Pain Without Gain, Krugman argued that austerity policies like those imposed in Greece have only resulted in higher levels of unemployment. Now, this sort of position is not only echoed by old school lib New Deal liberals by Krugman, but by elements of the socialist and self-described Marxist left. Rick Wolf from the University of Massachusetts has also made the argument that austerity is in some sense counterproductive. And there are elements on the socialist left who have echoed that argument and who argue instead that would be, what would be rational for capitalists to do is stimulate demand. Increase wages, increase social spending, etc. because this increased demand would then restore accumulation, restore economic growth, reduce unemployment. In other words, they hold out the promise of what could be a win-win solution to the economic crisis. You increase wages, you increase social spending, people buy crap, capitalists make profits, the economy grows, and everybody does well. This whole argument is based on the assertion that the roots of the economic crisis are a lack of effective consumer demand. Now this argument, which among economists left and right is called underconsumptionism, has a very long history. And its supporters range from revolutionary socialists like Rosa Luxemburg to pro-capitalist liberals like John Maynard Keynes. Despite the varied and sundry supporters of this position, 
for the most part, particularly since the late 1930s and particularly since the Second World War, under consumptionism, the idea that capitalism cannot survive without growing consumer demand has been a mainstay of the social democratic and reformist left in this country and throughout the world. Now, while we, many of us in this room as radicals and revolutionaries, may be repelled by the political conclusions of underconsumptionism, that there's a road out of the crisis that will benefit both capitalists and workers, that capitalism is an economic system with wise guidance through the state, can avoid crises, etc. The question actually remains is whether or not under consumptionism, this argument, provides a factually verifiable explanation of the crisis. And that's what I want to spend a bit of time on. And in order to sort of to approach this question, we have to start with, an, uh, with the actual movement of what Marx calls the rate of profit. <coughs> Under capitalism, capitalists make all decisions based on one and only one criteria, profitability. That's what, how they decide what they're going to produce, how they're going to produce it, where they produce it. And for Marx, profitability, the heartbeat of the, eco of the capitalist economic system, is expressed in a fairly simple fraction. S is surplus value. All the unpaid labor pumped out of workers in a capitalist society that form the basis of profits. C is what Marx calls constant capital. All of the investment in buildings, machinery, raw materials, etc. And V is variable capital. All the investment in wages, salaries, etc. Everybody follow me so far? Okay. So the rate of profit is the total amount of surplus value profits divided by what capitalists have to invest in buildings, machinery, and raw materials, and wages. Now we can also express this fraction as Okay. S over V is the relationship of surplus value, profits, to variable capital, wages. It's what Marx calls the rate of exploitation. How much capitalists are getting out of us each hour, each day, each week, each week. You divide that by C over V. Constant capital divided by variable capital. What Marx called the organic composition of capital the relationship of all the investment in buildings, machinery, etc., over all the investment in wages, salaries, and the like. Some people look a little confused. If people have questions about this, ask now. Why are you dividing constant capital by variable capital? Ah, in order so that in a minute I can show you what they need to, why the rate of profit falls, and what capitalists have to do to raise the rate of profit. Okay? That's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm expressing it this way, as well as S over C plus V. Now, how has this rate of profit, the heartbeat of capitalist accumulation, actually moved over the last 60 years? And now I'm going to ask you to look at what I just handed you, which are a set of graphs that were produced by the Marxist economist Anwar Sheikh and appeared in an article that he published in, 2000, in the Socialist Register 2011. Okay, and it, figures one and six, which are the figures on the front, give us, on the one hand, the actual and trend rate of profit of enterprise of non-US financial corporations from 1947 to 2007. That's what you have on the top. And the general rate of profit is the total Gross of monetary profits minus interest paid over the capital stock. On the bottom graph, we have what he calls the rate of profit of enterprise. Now, the rate of profit of enterprise is the rate of profit, the percentage of return they're making on their investments, minus the rate of interest. 
minus what capitalists are paying, productive capitalists are paying to banks and financial institutions to borrow the money, to buy the machinery, hire <laughs> workers, etc. It's that, that rate of profit is what Shake calls the central driving force of accumulation. It's the material foundations of the animal spirits of industrial capital. It's the average rate of profits that capitalists actually earn from productive investment. This is what, on the most immediate level, determines whether or not a capitalist will invest. Is he, make, is he or she making more in profits than he's paying in interest? Okay? Everybody follow me so far? Now, if we look at these two charts, we can, along with Shake, identify three distinct phases in the movement of profitability since 1947, over the last 60 years. The first is from 1947 to 1966. This was, for many on both the left, right, and center, the golden age of capitalism, the post-war boom, where <coughs> the years that met some of us gray-haired older folks in the room grew up where at least white working class people could buy homes and cars, etc., when standards of living were rising, the welfare state was expanding, etc. The next phase is the phase that, again, most of us are very familiar with, 1966 to 1982, what Shake calls the stagflation crisis. And here we see sharp declines both in the general rate of profit and, more importantly, the rate of profit of enterprise. The rate of profit of enterprise drops from 14% in 1966 to negative 5% in 1982. In other words, in 1982, if capitalists were stupid enough to invest, they were actually losing 5% of their investment. Okay, everybody follow me. These are the years through the late 60s into the 70s into the early 80s where you see continuous inflation in consumer goods and producer goods, but no real economic growth. This is the years that we see the oil shock. We see growing unemployment. Attack, the beginnings of the attacks on of unions in the private sector, etc. The third phase is from 1982 to 2007. And that's the era that our, comrade, our Canadian comrade David McNall in his book, the, Gold, the Global Slump, calls the neoliberal boom. In this year, period, we see a steady increase in both a steady trend in the general rate of profit but more importantly, we see a sharp increase in the rate of profit of enterprise. The rate of profit of enterprise, what capitalists are actually earning after they pay interest to the banks and financial corporations, rises from that low of negative 5% in 1982 to a high of 10% in 2005. Now, what caused this neoliberal boom? What allow for a restoration of profitability. Well, what Marx tells us in Capital is, in order for the rate of profit to be restored, the numerator on the equation has to rise, and the denominator in the equation has to fall. Okay? You have to raise the rate of surplus value. You have to increase the amount of profits in relationship to wages that you squeeze out of workers. At the same time, you've got to lower what Marx calls the organic composition of capital. You have to get rid of all the inefficient firms and get rid of what, what we can call the over-accumulation of capital, the fact that there's too much invested and not enough profits. And what we see in the 19, early 1980s and through the 90s and into the first decade of the 21st century is several things restoring profitability. First, there is a big wave of bankruptcies, not just in this country, but around the capitalist world. The, during the sharp recession of 1980-82, you see more bankruptcies in those two years than you see at any point since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Billions of dollars of capital invested in inefficient, uncompetitive, relatively unprofitable firms is, is, in effect, destroyed. It's not blown up like it was during the Second World War, but these companies go bankrupt, the factories stay 
uh, closed it, factories, offices, stores closed down, they're sold for scrap, etc. This process of what Marx called the devalorization of capital, reducing the organic composition of capital, continues through the 80s and 90s through the mergers and acquisition wave. Mergers and acquisitions become profitable companies buying up less profitable companies, spinning off, uh, selling off or junking the least profitable operations, laying off hundreds of thousands and millions of workers, etc. This was in some ways a continuation of the recession of 1980 and 82 in terms of destroying all of the dis unproduct unprofitable, uncompetitive capitalist firms. So we see a sharp reduction in the denominator of the fraction a reduction uh, in the organic composition of capital in the 1980s. We also see very, very low interest rates throughout the 80s and 90s. The adaptation of neoliberalism and monetarist policies allow real rates of interest to drop close to zero, which means that the rate of profit of enterprise, what capitalists get after they pay back the banks, continues to rise. But the third, and for our purposes, really crucial in terms of understanding the roots of the current crisis is we also see in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s a sharp increase in the rate of exploitation, a sharp increase in the rate of surplus value. And this is what where most of us in this room are intimately familiar with. There is, was a ra very radical depression in the rate of increase of real wages and an increase in the rate of exploitation. If you flip the sheet over and look at what is figure two, the one on the top, it shows that, looks at the relationship between hourly real wages, which means real wages adjusted for inflation, what wages can actually buy, and its relationship to hourly productivity, which is our closest measure of the rate of exploitation. And we see that the rate of exploitation rises rather, excuse me, rises rather sharply while real wages remained either stagnant until 1997, and even after 1997, the rate of increase of real wages, the rate of increase of the wages and salaries that we all earned lagged far behind the increases in productivity. Okay, everybody follow me so far. Okay. In figure three, what Shake does is try to look at what would have happened to the rate of profit if capitalists had not held down wage increases and increased productivity, increased the rate of exploitation. If they hadn't, in his words, taken matters into their own hands. And you see that while the rate of profit trends slightly upwards, it would have continued to fall sharply if, in fact, capitalists had not held down wages and increased output. <coughs> okay? In other words, the increased rate of exploitation was a crucial element in raising and maintaining high profits during the neoliberal boom. Now, most of this is the result of things that comrades in and around solidarity have talked about for the last 20 years. The spread of what's called lean production. On the one hand, the employers are able to get the union leaders to agree to concessions give backs in wages, benefits, and most importantly, work rules. A weakening of work rules allows capitalists to reorganize production to get more work out of fewer workers, to get people to work longer and harder for less. A small part of this reduction in real wages and increase in exploitation is what's sometimes called globalization. In particular, the creation of what's what Kim Moody and others have called global production chains, where the most wage-sensitive, most labor-intensive operations, producing things like cars, machinery, etc., are sent abroad, sent to Mexico, etc., where wages are much lower. 
Put simply, I'd argue that stagnant real wages, increased exploitation, in other words, an increase in the share of total income going to capital at the expense of labor, was one of the key driving forces of the capitalist expansion, the neoliberal boom, between 1982 and 2007. In other words, it's holding down wages that kept the system viable for almost 25 years. The argument that the current crisis that starts in 2007 is a result of holding down wages, for me, simply doesn't hold water. In fact, if they didn't hold down wages, profits would have started falling again in the 80s. Instead, I'd argue, following the argument Marx makes and, the argu and elaborated in a really clear way by David McMally in his book Global Sum, is that this is a crisis of overaccumulation. That there's too much capital, too many buildings, machinery, etc., and too little profit. Overaccumulation arises out of the very logic of capitalism. As capitalists compete, they introduce labor saving machinery. They raise, they raise the organic composition of capital in order to cut costs and undercut their competitors. Now, because capitalist competition is this anarchic process, where there is no planning and nobody's looking over their shoulder, they're all looking out for the short run, the result is that at some point there's too much capital invested compared to the amount of profit generated. So that the very things that, that drive periods of growth and expansion under capitalism eventually bring its end. So, what I would argue is this crisis is not caused by a lack of effective demand. It's not caused by, an un, it's not an underconsumption crisis. Instead, this is, like every other capitalist crisis, the result of the overaccumulation of capital. Thus, the solution to the crisis is not increasing demand through government stimulus programs, expanded social welfare, or higher real wages. All of those things will continue to depress the rate of profit. Now, austerity clearly will lead to short-term pain. When they cut wages, when they cut social services, when the government stops stimulating the economy, you do get sharp drops in output, you get more bankruptcies, you get more unemployment. However, that short-term pain is the necessary condition for long-term gain, for the restoration of profitability. Put another way, the same mechanisms that restored profitability during the neoliberal boom, the destruction of inefficient capitals, and an increase in the rate of exploitation, raising this, lowering this, are again what is needed to restore profitability today. Now, how does this analysis help us understand the analysis of the current crisis help us make sense out of growing government deficits? The fact these deficits which are used across the world to justify attacks on social welfare, the public sector, etc. Well, essentially I'd argue there are three causes to the sharp rise in public deficits in the last five to seven years. The first is, are the pro-capitalist tax policies that every capitalist government, both North and South, have pursued since the 1980s. Second, and this is a short-term factor, is the massive bailout of the corporations in 2007, 8, and 9. And David McNally's written some very detailed stuff on how much of the European sovereign debt crisis is a direct short-term result of, of the bailouts. But the third cause, which is, I think, in fact, the most important, is the crisis itself. As accumulation, as economic growth declines, as profits shrink, as fewer people are working, as their wages are pushed down, the amount of taxes that capitalist states collect 
either in corporate income tax or personal income tax, falls. Now, the reason I think that this last one is the most important is this. In the late 1980s and through the 1990s, most capitalist states, including the U.S., were able to actually reduce their deficits. Bill Clinton could leave office claiming that he had, in fact, reduced the federal deficit. Despite the fact that corporate tax rates remained very, very low through the 90s, since the 1980s. The, the neoliberal boom, the economic growth of those years, allowed for a reduction of deficits despite the low tax rates, particularly on capital. So that this, the growing deficits, I would argue, are first and foremost the, a reflection of the long-term economic downturn. Now, finally, I want to make a case based on this analysis of the rationality of austerity. That a tax on wages, working conditions, social services, etc., are logical and rational policies for capitalists when faced, as they are today, with a crisis of declining profits rooted in the overaccumulation of capital. Remember, there are two key conditions for the restoration of profitability and the restoration of economic growth under capitalism. You gotta raise the rate of surplus value, you gotta lower the organic composition of capital. Austerity, wage cuts, reorganizing work, etc., directly raises the rate of surplus value in two important ways. One, lower wages, speed up, multitasking, and the like, get more work, work per hour of work. They raise the productivity of labor, the rate of exploitation. Workers work longer and harder for less. We've seen this process go on and it is being deepened in the private sector. One of the gifts of the Obama administration when it first came in was structurally adjusting the auto industry in return for bailouts of Chrysler and GM the UAW reopened their contracts and agreed that all new hires would make 50% of what old hires made. In other words, they reduced starting wages to $14 an hour, matching starting wages in non-union plants in the South. The attack on the public sector is also geared around lowering wages and benefits, reorganizing work, etc., in order to raise the rate of surplus value. And secondly, austerity also raises the rate of surplus value, particularly social service austerity increases the rate of surplus value by increasing competition among workers. The reason that labor movements historically in the 19th and 20th century demanded social welfare, demanded that the state pay unemployment insurance, pensions, etc., was that so that when workers were unemployed or underemployed, they had an alternative to taking the first job that came along. And social welfare, however punitive and inadequate it actually was in practice, provided a minimal alternative to the unemployed and underemployed. As welfare has been continuously cut back since the 70s, we see increased competition for jobs. The, the small shelter that workers had to stay out of the labor market, wait for a better job, not line up for those, the jobs of those of us who still have jobs, disappears. And as there's more competition among workers for jobs, real wages, re this depresses real wages. So austerity very directly raises the rate of surplus value. I would also argue that austerity can contribute to the destruction of inefficient capitals, to lowering the denominator on the equation. In the 1970s, capitalists and policymakers around the world discovered that if you continue to increase state spending and state deficits in a period of low profits, you got no growth and inflation. You got stagflation. The 1970s, governments around the capitalist world 
remained committed to Keynesian economics. There's a crisis, there's a slowdown, let's pump up demand. Let's cut taxes on workers. Let's increase social welfare, etc. in the 70s. And what we'll spend more, we'll increase the public sector. We'll spend more money on bond, everything from bombs to housing, etc. The result was not an increase in output, a revival of accumulation, but stagnant accumulation and inflation. Now, not only did Keynesian stimulus in the 70s not restore profitability and accumulation, that would come with neoliberalism in the 1980s, but inflation actually allows less efficient capitalist firms to survive the competitive marketplace without reorganizing production, without introducing new machinery, or without reorganizing the labor process. Inflation and the resulting fluctuation of prices of inputs and outputs effectively loosened market discipline on firms. Firms could survive by taking advantage of temporarily low prices for inputs and temporarily high prices for outputs. The shift to neoliberal policies in the late 70s and early 1980s, the so-called Volcker shock, named for the US Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker, who was, by the way, a lifelong Democrat and a convinced Keynesian until the moment he uh, instituted these new policies, not only did this did the Volcker shock spark a res the recession of 1980 and 82 and the resulting wave of bankruptcies, but it radically reduced the rate of inflation. As a result, starting from the 80s on, capitalists who were going to survive the competitive battle were compelled to reorganize the work process, introduce new technologies and machineries in order to get more work out of fewer workers, in other words, they were compelled in this non-inflationary environment to reorganize work along the lines of lean production. Those who failed go under, were forced into bankruptcy, further reducing excess capacity and relieving the overaccumulation of capital. Now, today, capitalists and their political representatives across the established political spectrum quite logically and rationally pursue the policy of austerity. Austerity, again, despite the short-term pain that it will inflict both on capital and labor in the short term, are necessary for, is necessary for long-term gains, for a restoration of profitability. In other words, there's no win-win solution to the current economic crisis. Either capitalists are going to discipline their own ranks and impose sharp declines in working class living standards and working conditions, or the economic stagnation and instability we've been experiencing for the last five years are going to continue. The logic and rationality of austerity, from my point of view, explains why it's embraced by the right, left, and center, the entire political establishment not only in the US, but across the capitalist world. To put it simply, there are no enlightened or progressive capitalists with whom working people can ally against austerity. There aren't this group of enlightened capitalists who are going to step forward and come up with a Keynesian solution that will benefit both capital and labor. They don't exist. They learned hard lessons in the 70s and 80s that austerity, neoliberalism, etc., is the way to restore profitability. Now, let me be clear. This analysis does not mean that we as revolutionaries and radicals should not support any and all demands for increased social spending, improved wages, <coughs> benefits, etc. Clearly, we do. What we, however, our main difference with the reformists and the liberals is not so much about what we're demanding, because the reformists and liberals can occasionally raise questions of tax the rich, etc. The difference is going to be about not the so much the demands we make, but how we're going to achieve them. From this perspective, it's only an independent, militant, and mass movement of working people one that is capable and willing to engage in massive social disruption 
and in particular the disruption of production, that will be able to even temporarily stop the austerity offensive. The inability or unwillingness, and we can debate what this, whether, where it's, whether they're unable or unwilling, the inability or unwillingness of the forces of official reform, the official leaderships of the unions and social movements, to engage in these sort of struggles is what has led them over time to abandon the struggle for reform. So we get, I mean, in my, back in New York State where I come from, all the New York City unions, particularly the public sector unions, campaigned for a millionaire's tax, campaigned for, re, you know, redistributing tax income, et cetera, et cetera. This is what they made the right demands. But their unwillingness or incapacity to actually organize real disruption, a real struggle, is what leads them to inevitably abandon the struggle for these reforms. Okay? Now, so far, we've seen mass protests against austerity. In Europe, We've seen the official labor movements launch limited one-day general strikes, <coughs> while masses of unemployed and underemployed young people have occupied public spaces, the Indignados in Spain and similar movements. In the U.S., we've seen massive protests here in Wisconsin last year and in Occupy. While these movements, these protests, have temporarily shifted public discussion and rekindle the hope that there is an alternative to austerity, they have not effectively stopped the austerity drive. Developing a strategy and tactics that can help us transform these protest movements into effective mass struggles is the political challenge that not only folks in solidarity, but all radicals and revolutionaries face, and I hope will begin the process of addressing at this school today. Thank you.